Hello, hello everyone. Today we are going to talk about the chi-square and the Fisher's exact test and what we need to think about when we run them. As I always say, it is easy to do stats to produce a p-value, especially with PRISM, but it is not so easy to do good stats, as in stats we can believe to actually quantify how much we can trust what our data are telling us. In the nutshell, we use a chi-square or Fisher's exact test when we want to know if there is a significant difference between two proportions. The chi-square can actually compare more than two, but we will not talk about it in this video. Now, if we want to do a good job, there are a few questions we need to answer to. First, what is a qualitative variable on which the tests are applied? Then, there are two tests, so there must be a difference between them. We may also wonder how the tests work, as it would be silly to use a test if we do not know how it works. Finally, what does it mean significant? Is there more to it than a p-value? Okay, let's get on with it. First of all, what is a qualitative variable? Well, it is about quality and not quantity, so the values are not numerical. Qualitative data, also referred to as categorical data, come in three flavors. Nominal, in which case they take a name, like a genotype or species, for instance. Ordinal, um, when the values have an intrinsic order, like three levels of happiness. And binary, when values come from two categories, like alive or dead, for example. Okay, next. What's the difference between the tests? Well, for a start, the chi-square test is dead easy to calculate by hand, but the fissures very hard which is why many software, including PRISM, will not run a fissures on contingency tables bigger than 2 by 2 because it is too heavy computationally. Second, the fissures exact test was specifically designed for small samples and it will be more accurate than, than the chi-square. It will give an exact p-value, hence the name, whereas the chi-square will only give an approximation. Conversely, the chi-square is more accurate than the fissures on large samples. Now, it is because of the complexity of the Fisher's formula that I am going to concentrate on the chi-square one. But really, we can think of the two tests as working in a similar fashion, or rather, we can interpret their outcome in the same way. So, how does the chi-square work? Well, the main thing is that it is going to compare observed frequencies with expected ones. The observed frequencies are the one, well, we observe in an experiment, duh, and the expected ones are the one we would have expected to see if there had been no relationship whatsoever between the two variables. Now, like most statistical tests, the chi-square produces a statistic, chi-square, which like most statistics is about a difference of some kind. As we can see here in the numerator, we have the difference between observed and expected, so the bigger the difference, the more likely it is that what we observe is not due to chance. Okay, so enough theory, let's do it. We are going to look at line dancing cats and why not. Right, let's look at an experiment where cats were trained to line dance with two different rewards, food or affection. The pivotal question here is, is there a relationship between the rewards and the proportion of cats line dancing? You notice that I only took about relationship here and not causality. A stats test is never about causality, but only about the relationship between variables or factors. It is our interpretation which introduces causality. Anyway, these guys used 68 cats. That's a lot of cats. And the results are presented in the contingency table on the left, and the graph on the right. Remember, a good graphical representation says most of the story. So here, looking at this graph, we are expecting some significance. So we are pretty clear on how to get the observed frequencies, but what about the expected ones? I am sure you're dying to know, so let me show you. Let's look at an example, at the expected frequency of cats line dancing after having received food as a reward. There are two ways to figure it out, the so-called direct count approach, which is a direct application of the chi-square formula and the official way to think about it, and a bit of a more intuitive way, referred to as the probability approach, 
Depending on how your brain works, you may prefer one or the other, so I present both. Okay, so first, the direct count approach. In that case, the expected frequency equals row total times column total divided by the grand total. So, for our example, it is 32 times 32 divided by 68, which is 15.1. That's the number of cats we would have expected to line dance after having received food as a reward if there had been no relationship whatsoever between reward and likelihood of line dancing. Now, if it does not make too much sense to you, let's try the probability approach. It is relying on the multiplicative rule, which you may remember. The probability of the joint occurrence of two or more independent events is the product of the individual probabilities. So, in that experiment, regardless the rewards, the probability of a cat line dancing is 32 out of 68. Similarly, regardless the outcome, the probability of a cat receiving food as a reward is also 32 out of 68. So, the probability of these two independent events, which is what the expected frequencies is about, right, to occur at the same time is simply the multiplication of the two probabilities, which gives us 0.22, and 22% of 68 is 15.1, voila. And of course, this is done for all four groups. Now, we can see that the expected values are much more similar to one another than the observed one, which makes sense since it is supposed to be pretty random. And they would be even more similar if the design was perfectly balanced, which it is not. We have a bit more cats in one group than the other. Now that we have, one way or another, the observed and expected frequencies, let's apply the chi-square formula. Okay, so on the left, the observed frequencies, and on the right, the expected ones. The next step is just algebra, and with the values we have, the chi-square formula gives us 28.4. Now, the question is, is 28.4 big enough for the test to be significant? We could do it the old-fashioned way. We could compare our chi-square value to the critical one from the chi-square table. We would select 0 0.05 as the significance level and one degree of freedom as we are looking at a 2 by 2 table. In our case, we can see that the chi-square value is way above the critical value, so yes, there is significance. I explain more about the critical value and degrees of freedom in the videos on power analysis and descriptive statistics. Now, luckily, we do not have to do it by hand, nor do we need dusty stats table because we have PRISM. As always, doing stats with PRISM is intuitive and pretty straightforward once we have chosen the correct table format, which in our case is contingency, of course. Now, by default, PRISM will have chosen the Fisher test for us because we have a 2x2 two two table. If we had a bigger one, it would have chosen the chi-square approach. The Yates correction is supposed to improve the p-value given by the test, which is an approximation, but it overdoes it, meaning that the p-values get too big. Um, on top of it, not everyone agrees on it, so it is probably best to ignore it altogether. We can also calculate the effect sizes, such as the odds ratio, which is pretty cool. It is literally the ratio of the odds, the odds of dancing in one group over the odds of dancing in the other one. These effect sizes are much more used in epidemiology than in bench sciences, for instance. And here are the results. On the left, we have the Fisher's exact test, and on the right, the chi-square we did together. So, we reach the same conclusion, which is that there is a significant association between type of reward and likelihood of dancing. We can even be more specific and say that if you are a dancing cat, you are almost 22 times more likely to have received food than affection as a reward. Now, in data analysis, there is more than just significance. In the context of qualitative data, if they can be presented as percentages, like in the graph on the right, the test should always, always be run on actual counts. If we use percentages, we make our sample size artificially 100, which can overestimate the real sample, like in here, or underestimate it. Remember, that significance is not, the, is not only about effect size, it is also about sample size. 
So we need to use the actual counts to get a p-value we can trust, as in consistent with the confidence we have in our data, which has a lot to do with the size of the sample. A p-value should always be interpreted in the context of the experiment and in particular, the power associated with it. If you are shaky on that concept, check out the video on power calculation. Thank you for listening and don't forget, stats don't have to be scary. Thank you.